Along with several established and formal religions, there also exist countless folk religions practiced across South Asia. These involve veneration of deities that can include ancestors and village deities, as well as deities who are avatars belonging to the pantheon of Hindu deities. If we move across the physical landscape of South Asia, we find it dotted with shrines which can range from figurative sticks and stones to elaborate shrines with dedicated festivals. However, folk religious traditions are not limited to Hinduism, but very often occupy liminal spaces between formal religious traditions, often transcending boundaries of one tradition into another. Folk deities are venerated from across a spectrum of religions by devotees who seek their benevolence for various purposes, ranging from general well-being of family and community to specific reasons like protection of crops or for fertility. Folk religious practices do not exist in exclusion to formal religions and devotees associate with more than one tradition often merging traditions seamlessly. Such practices are not necessarily tied to a single religion either. Belief systems that assure people protection and beneficence can often extend across religions. It is not unusual to find Hindu mothers seeking blessings for their children at a Muharram procession or Muslims visiting Hindu shrines dedicated to curing mental health problems. It would not be wrong to say that South Asian folk religious practices fill up the space between formal religious observances and at times even provide spiritual sustenance that formal religions are not able to. Further, folk religious practices that anthropologist Mackie Marriott calls little tradition address concerns that are intimate and close to people's own concerns and often in languages and expressions that devotees relate to. The deities that are worshipped in these traditions are often drawn from their own context, raising concerns that are important for the devotees, which could range from protection from natural disasters, diseases, protection of cattle, etc. Moreover, folk practices are often fluid and adaptive and provide space to shifting realities of communities. However, over long periods of time, folk religious traditions can also crystallize and acquire their own orthodoxies. These can also become highly ritualized and hierarchical, defined by hegemonic practices. Considering the vast plethora of folk religious practices, an observer from outside may feel that these religious traditions exist without any system depending merely on reasons associated with the followers. But this is not so. Despite a wide variety and unaccountable numbers, as well as fantastical sounding rituals and belief systems, often folk religions emerge in response to specific needs of the groups that are practicing them. Scholars have attempted to understand patterns and schematization through, though there is no doubt that uh, there is a lot that defies available frames of understanding religions as well as belief systems. In this lecture, I am going to discuss some typologies which broadly systematize some of the folk religions practiced in South Asia. Folk religious practices are often associated with complex questions of origins, of migrations and contemporary locations which are often explained through complex myths. According to the anthropologist Claude Lévi-Strauss, who developed typologies for myths, all over the world, myths are made up of the simplest units or mythemes and contain both contradictory elements as well as those elements that open the possibility of resolving the contradictions. According to Mirzia Iliad, who has studied religions across the world in comparative perspective, myths and rituals allow societies to relive primal and sacral moments and spaces which they cannot on what Iliad calls profane historical time. So all religious traditions, but particularly the folk religions, allow communities to engage with questions of origins as well as others that are important for their existence. The earliest evidences of folk religious practices can be witnessed in form of worship of different elements of nature, like rivers, mountains, trees, animals, which both provided beneficence as well as were sources of destruction. We find shrines dedicated to several such forces all over the landscape some of which date to prehistoric periods. In some instances, these shrines are located within what are considered to be sacred spaces like groves, where species with whom communities have close relationships like the sacred fig or the people, banyan or bargad, prosopis or khejri or shami trees. 
as you can see in the image. These relationships are explained through elaborate myths that, are connect, uh, that connect with originators of communities or heroes to these trees. For example, Pandavas, the heroes of the epic Mahabharata, are believed to have hidden their weapons in these trees according to narratives popular in different regions. Within these groves, small shrines, sometimes collection of stones, at others, depiction of snakes or rocks in figurines, provide space for worship of elements that are considered integral to self-construction of the communities. These symbols have acquired newer meanings with time and have often been incorporated within the broader religious traditions. For example, snake shrines which in prehistoric times could have been established without necessarily having any connection with the deity are now often worshipped uh, in association with Shiva, one of the deities of the Hindu holy trinity. Along with Shiva, in northwestern India, snake shrines are often placed in close proximity to shrines dedicated to local deities Gogaji and Tejaji, who are believed to protect cattle and people against snake bites. Another category of shrines that can be found in several parts of South Asia are those dedicated to ancestors. Ancestor shrines can range from ones dedicated to a single family tree to those where the ancestor is seen as someone who protects the clan, village or community. In the former context, ancestors are believed to be benevolent souls who continue to protect the family after death and who have to be fed and prayed to on several occasions. These can often be found in the form of small shrines on the outskirts of the village where remembrances of ancestors in the form of stones or some other such objects is placed after the death of the ancestor. Such shrines are often family specific with all others including married girls being excluded from such shrines. Ancestors or pitras are often considered benevolent but can turn malevolent when they are not worshipped properly and can lead to disease, crop failure, economic loss etc. To keep the ancestors mollified, families hold regular prayers especially during the Shraddha Paksha. Apart from the shrines dedicated to immediate family members, there also exist shrines that are dedicated to people who are considered to be general community ancestors, who extend their protection to the communities. Such people are often believed to have been heroes who laid their lives protecting communities. In Rajasthan region, this particular kind of hero is called a Bhomia or a Jujhar, who is often believed to have been killed while protecting cattle, especially cows from enemies. A section of such heroes are those who continue to fight even after they are beheaded and are propitiated on reaching the village boundary by women who sprinkle indigo or vermilion over them. Once such heroes die, their shrines are established in sacred groves on the outskirts of the village where they are ritually worshipped by the community that seeks their beneficence. Babuji, a horse-born warrior who died while protecting cows, is one of the most famous uh, such bhumiya whose shrines are located in many villages in the desert region of Rajasthan. In southern India, shrines dedicated to twins Ponnar Shankar fall within similar typology as they are seen as heroes who died for the good of their people. Another such example of sacrificial tradition is Ghazi Peer or Balimiya, a Muslim saint in Behraj, UP, who like Pabuji, the hero mentioned earlier, left his wedding pavilion to protect the cows that were being herded away by a local king. Both Hindus and Muslims participate in the festival celebrated to commemorate the sacrifice of Ghazemiya or Salar Mahmud. Similar shrines are called Paliyas in Gujarat and Viragals in Karnataka and Tamil Nadu. These can be represented as a single horse rider or sometimes by elaborately carved stone pillars depicting armies as a common memorial to all who died. At times, these memorials also depict a cow and a calf and at others the whole scene of a cattle raid. The more ornate pillars were erected by kings or other powerful people of the region. Common people often established simpler shrines. At times, these could also be simply empty shrines where lamps are lit and prayers are offered. In mountainous regions, particularly around Ladakh, northeastern India and Tibet, piles of stones stacked one over the other called the money stones are found. These can be inscribed with the money mantra or can just be stacks that represent shrines dedicated to holy spirits that protect travelers who offer their prayers to these stacks on their journeys. 
Tibetans also associate the money stacks with the heroic stories of the ancestor king Gesar and his horse. Another form of ancestor worship that is carried out is worship of satis or women who immolated themselves after the deaths of their husbands. Though very often associated with the western Indian state of Rajasthan, sati shrines are found in Gujarat, Tamil Nadu and Karnataka also. The iconography of these shrines also varies. The sati shrines in Rajasthan and Gujarat are represented by engraving hands of the women and in some cases where it is claimed that mass sati took place, particularly in case of polygamous kings, there could also be several hands engraved on a pillar. The sati pillars in southern India often represent female figures often carrying mirrors or other objects of female adornment. In the existing myths around sati shrines, it is believed that satis are endowed with immense power just before they ascend the funereal pyre. In these moments, they turn from being ordinary mortal women to deities who protect their families. Such female figures are also part of yet another type of folk religious traditions that is the fertility and mother goddess cults. While there are numerous Hindu temples dedicated to goddess traditions, these also seem to incorporate both an upward movement of local goddess cults as well as parochializing of universal goddess traditions. For example, there exist 52 Shakti Pithas or the primal goddess shrines where it is believed that various parts of goddess fell after the fight with the buffalo demon Mahisha. These pithas are, also, are spread all over South Asia ranging from Baluchistan to Nepal and in various parts of India. However, similar narratives about fights between goddess and demons are found in multiple local traditions and while these shrines are not recognized as Adi Shakti pithas, they still hold very important positions around the rural landscapes as protector goddesses. Each one of these goddesses carries similar sounding myths. For example, in my own village, a deity called Chandrabadni or the moon bodied goddess is believed to have been slain by a demon while bathing. Thus her head fell in a place called Surkunda or the head shrine and her naked torso fell in another place. The shrine is believed to house the naked torso by, hidden by a curtain with the worship carried out from across the curtain. Even the priest is blindfolded when he carries out the rituals which involve crossing into the curtained area. In Prast, the shrine was a very small temple atop a hill, but over the years it has grown into a very large temple accessible by road. Another aspect of goddess shrines is that they are associated with conservation and protection of local environment. The presence of goddess shrines in forests, pastures and sacred groves is supposed to regulate the unbridled cutting of firewood and fodder. The rules around these spaces are governed by norms supposedly created by goddesses, failure to adhere to which can lead to disasters. One such example is the bone bibi of Sundarbans in Bengal, who is believed to have created rules of purity and piety while entering the marsh. In return for following the rules, bone bibi and her brother Shah Jangli protect forest dwellers from tigers as well as from oceanic storms. In some narratives of Rajasthan, we come across virgin Charini goddesses who are believed to have shifted the course of rivers in the region to punish the impertinence of a local king Umar Sumaru who propositioned marriage to the goddess. The Charini goddesses are believed to be living manifestations of the Adi Shakti Hingalaj who are deified on their death. One of the most important of these goddesses is Karni, whose shrine in Bikanir is seen as the abode of rats believed to be the transmigrating souls of the Charan worshippers of Karni. A number of these goddess shrines are found all over Rajasthan, Gujarat and Sindh in Pakistan offering protection to their devotees. Most of these goddesses are also known for their close associations with animals like goats, crocodiles, cocks, tigers, lions and rats. The areas around these shrines are governed by a number of conservationist rules around forests and sacred groves. These beliefs are very deeply rooted in the minds of devotees. In 2014, the mountainous state of Uttarakhand faced a cloudburst which led to a massive flood and death and destruction. These were attributed to the shifting of the shrine of Dhari Devi on the banks of river Alakananda, one of the rivers affected by the flood. Goddess shrines are seen as manifestations of fierceness and a large number of these are without male consorts. In many instances, like in the case of the Draupadi Amman temples, 
dedicated to Draupadi, the leading female character of the epic Mahabharata, the goddesses are believed to fight against injustice, particularly against women by their in-laws or even within their own families. Narratives around these goddesses find themselves being falsely accused of some kind of sin, often sexual deviance and getting into a destructive rage, which unless propitiated can destroy towns and cities. If not calmed down, these goddesses are believed to have the power to unleash diseases, particularly aimed at male children. Mother goddess shrines do not just act as protectors of families, but are particularly prayed to by young married women as deities of fertility. The Kamakya temple in Assam, where the main festival is around the menstruating goddess, is one of the foremost fertility cults that grants fertility to infertile couples. Manifestations of Kamakya are often represented as icons of menstruating women or female genitals are found in other parts of the country as well. Within popular and dominant goddess worship traditions, like the annual Durga Puja, the worship of virgin prepubescent girls is considered to be very auspicious. This tradition is also followed in Nepal, where prepubescent kumaris are installed in temples and are worshipped as living incarnations of goddesses. A number of goddess shrines are also seen as protectors of male children. Of these, Sheetala is believed to cause measles and should be prayed to in order to protect children. Others like Ahoi Mata bless women with children, particularly male children, and protect them. Thus, female goddesses are seen both as powerful virgins and mothers, whose role is to ensure protection of de devotees. So, in this lecture, we try to look at the typologies or different kinds of folk religious traditions that are present. While most of the examples discussed come from Hinduism, in practice, they permeate across religions, with local myths becoming part of other religions too. Particularly around coastal regions in Karnataka, Tamil Nadu and Kerala, we find instances of a number of Muslim deities or Bhutas, like the Vavara Swami, who are worshipped by local devotees. It is very difficult to draw a clear line between formal religious practices and folk practices. They usually seamlessly merge into each other, with people using formalization of rituals and folk practices as a way of social mobility. According to Stuart Blackburn, a very prominent scholar of Indian folk religions, as folk religions expand socially and geographically beyond clan and sister worship, they include rituals and narratives of other social groups. So folk practices are not static. In fact, shifts in folk practices reveal more about changing social locations of the communities than anything else.